This lesson is called Conditional Statements. We're going to learn about writing conditional statements in if-then form, writing counterexamples and using symbols of logic, and we will write the converse, inverse, and contrapositive. A conditional statement is a statement that can be written in if-then form. If one thing happens, then something else happens. For example, if your feet smell and your nose runs, then you're built upside down. That's an if-then statement. It is conditional. Conditional statements have two parts. The hypothesis is the part of the conditional statement that follows if. It's the given information or the condition. And the conclusion is the part that follows then. That's the result of the given information. And just one thing to notice, if is not a part of the hypothesis, then is not a part of the conclusion. It's only the words that follow. Now, conditional statements can be written in if-then form to emphasize which part is the hypothesis and which is the conclusion. And you should turn the subject into the hypothesis. Or if you even want to think of it sort of in a cause-effect kind of way, whatever part is the cause, that's typically the hypothesis. And whatever is the effect, that's typically the conclusion, if you can think of it that way. So, vertical angles are congruent. That's a conditional statement. And you can write it in if-then form. Think about it. What's the subject? Is it being vertical angles or being congruent? Well, the subject is being vertical angles. So you could say, if two angles are vertical, then they are congruent. Now it's written in if-then form. It says the same thing, but now it's written specifically in if-then form. Another example, seals swim. What's the subject, being a seal or swimming? Well, the subject is being a seal. So you could say, you know, well, actually, what you shouldn't say is, don't say, if seals then swim, because that doesn't make any sense. Add words and, and make sure that it, it sounds right when you say it. So if an animal is a seal, then it swims. Even though you added a bunch of words, you're still saying the same thing. If an animal is a seal, then it swims. So any conditional statement can be written in if-then form. Conditional statements can be true or false. And it's false only when the hypothesis is true, but the conclusion is false. And a counterexample is used to show that a statement is not always true and is therefore false. Because a, a conditional statement is only true when it's true 100% of the time. If it's true 100 times and then it's false one way, then it's false. It has to be true every time to be true. So here's a conditional statement. If you live in Virginia, then you live in Richmond. Well, that, that's true sometimes because people who live in Richmond do live in Virginia. Is there a counterexample? Of course there is. Any city in Virginia besides Richmond. What if I live in Virginia, but I live in Coburn? So even though I live in Virginia, I don't live in Richmond. I live somewhere else. So that's a counterexample. Therefore, this statement is false. This is a false conditional statement. And these three dots here, that's the symbol for the word therefore. So if a hypothesis is true, but the conclusion is false, then the statement is false. Here's some more symbols. You can use symbols to modify or connect statements. The hypothesis is typically used using the letter P. And the conclusion typically uses the letter Q. So you might say, if P, then Q. Or you could say that P implies Q. And even another way to look at it 
is to just say P and then an arrow Q. All of those mean the same thing and they all use P and Q instead of writing out the whole statement. So P with the arrow Q that's used to represent if P then Q or P implies Q. Let's do some examples here. Let's suppose that statement P says a number is prime and statement Q says a number has exactly two divisors. Well, if I want to know P implies Q or if P then Q, then I would write out the whole statement. Since P is first and then Q, I will say if P then Q, if a number is prime, then it has exactly two divisors. Notice I've got the if then, because this is a conditional statement now, if statement P, then statement Q. Here are a few conditional statements. Let's underline the hypothesis and circle the conclusion. Well, the hypothesis comes after if and the conclusion comes after then. If 2x minus 6 equals 10, then x equals 8. Well, the hypothesis comes after if, so we will underline 2x minus 6 equals 10. The conclusion comes after then, so I'll circle x equals 8. Notice I didn't underline if and I didn't circle then because those words are not a part of the hypothesis or conclusion. If an angle is acute, then the angle is not obtuse. Hypothesis comes after if, so the hypothesis, an angle is acute. The conclusion comes after then, so the conclusion, the angle is not obtuse. And got a little typo there. The angle is not obtuse. If hypothesis, then conclusion. Let's write each statement in if-then form. Angles that form a linear pair are supplementary. Well, what's the subject? The subject is that some angles form a linear pair, and then that's, that looks like what it would be for the hypothesis, and then they would be supplementary. So let's word that out here. If, you see angles that form a linear pair, you could say, if angles form a linear pair, notice I didn't include the word that because it didn't make sense. If that angles form a linear pair or if angles that form a linear pair, it doesn't really make a lot of sense that way. Then, I'm not just going to say then are supplementary. I'm going to say then they are supplementary. So add the words necessary to have the sentence sound correct. A right angle has a measure of 90. Well, the hypothesis is the subject. That's the right angle. So if a right angle, how about if an angle is a right angle? If an angle is a right angle, then has a measure of 90. How about then it has a measure of 90, or then its measure is 90. There's a few ways you could say it. So th think if hypothesis, then conclusion, if blank, then blank, and add or take away words that have the sentence sound proper. Here's some more symbols. This is the tilde symbol, a little squiggly line there, and that's used to represent the word not. 
So if statement P says the angle is obtuse, then statement not P, well, just add a word not to it. The angle is obtuse. The angle is not obtuse. Not P is the opposite of P. So it could be acute, right, or straight. Any of those are angles that are not obtuse. What if statement P says, I am not happy? Well, then not P would say, I am not not happy. Well, you don't want to say that. If there's already a not in, just take the not out. I am happy. So if there is a not, then take the not out for not P. You wouldn't want to say not not. In a conjunction, a conjunction is two statements that are grouped together with the word and. And this upside down V is the symbol for the word and. The way to remember that is that the word and, if you think of a capital A in and, that upside down V almost looks like a capital A. lost my screen there for a second. So I've got the, the word and, that's the upside down V. So if I had statement P, a number is even, and statement Q, a number is divisible by three, and I wanted to say P and Q, then I would simply say a number is even and it is divisible by three. So you say statement P, then you say the word and, and then you say statement Q. Now for and, it has to be true for both statements. So the only choices are the numbers that are even and divisible by three. Two is even, but it's not divisible by three, so I'm not including two. Four is even, but it's not divisible by three, so I'm not including it. Six is even, and six is divisible by three. That's why six is here can't be 8, can't be 10, it can be 12, and so on. So all of these numbers are the ones that are even and divisible by 3. Conjunctions are only true if both statements are true. A disjunction is two statements that are joined using the word or. And a, a regular V is the symbol for the word or. So if statement P says a number of, is even and statement Q says a number is divisible by three, then P or Q would simply say statement P or statement Q. So you would say a number is even or it is divisible by three. Now the word or you only have to be true for one or the other or both. So my group here includes all even numbers and all numbers divisible by three. So two is even, but it's not divisible by three. Three is divisible by three, but it's not even. Four is even, but it's not divisible by three. Six is even and divisible by three. So it's, it's included if it's true for the first statement or if it's true for the second statement, or if it's true for both. The only numbers that are not included are the numbers that are not in either statement. So a disjunction is only false if both statements are false. If you use the word and, it has to be true for both statements. To use the word or, you only have to be true for one or the other or both. So let's write some statements here. Use the following statements to write a compound statement for each conjunction and disjunction and then find the truth value. P says 24 hours equals one day. Q says congruent supplementary angles each have a measure of 90. 
and R says negative 10 plus 9 is less than negative 1. So the first question is not P. Well, let's say the opposite of statement P. 24 hours does not equal one day. And I wrote house instead of hours for some strange reason. <laughs> so 24 hours does not equal one day. Well, that's false because 24 hours is a day. So that's a false statement. It still is what not P says, but it's a false statement. How about not R? Well, R says negative 10 plus 9 is less than negative 1. So not R would be negative 10 plus 9 is greater than or equal to negative 1. You want to be careful with the inequalities. If one of them says less than, then not would be greater than or equal to. Don't just say greater than. You also have to say equal to. And if the first statement says less than or equal to, then the second one would say greater than. So be careful with those. Now, negative 10 plus 9 is negative 1. Is negative 1 greater than or equal to negative 1? Yes, it is, all the time, too. So that one's true. P and Q? Well, P says 24 hours equals one day, and Q says congruent supplementary angles each have a measure of 90. So P and Q would say 24 hours equals one day and congruent supplementary angles each have a measure of 90. Now, 24 hours does equal a day, so that part's right. Congruent supplementary angles each have a measure of 90. Well, to be supplementary, they have to add up to 180. And if they each have a measure of 90, 90 plus 90 is 180. That makes sense. So first part's true, second part's true, and needs everything to be true to be true. And since everything is true, then this is a true statement. This next question is asking Q or R. So for Q or R, we will say, for Q, congruent supplementary angles each have a measure of 90. For R, negative 10 plus 9 is less than negative 1, joined with the word or. Now, Q is true. R is false. But true or false is true, because if at least one thing is true, then or is true. The next one says, not P or Q. Not P is the opposite of P, so that will say 24 hours does not equal one day. Or Q, which says congruent supplementary angles each have a measure of 90. Since not P is false and Q is true, False or true is true, because with or, if at least one thing is true, then it's true. Number six, not P and not R. Do the opposite of each one. Not P says 24 hours does not equal one day. Not R says negative 10 plus 9 is greater than or equal to negative 1. Since not P is false 
and not R is true, false and true is false. Remember with and, everything has to be true in order to be true. So look at the statements and then look at the symbolic representation. Write the statements out based on the symbols and then determine the truth value. Next we have the converse, inverse, and contrapositive. These are other types of conditional statements that shuffle things around and, and change them a little bit. And based on whether or not they're true, it can make a very, very strong conditional statement. So depending on whether these statements are true or not makes the original statement even stronger. So the converse, it simply takes the original if-then statement and it switches them around. P leading to Q becomes Q to P. So flip it around. So if P to Q says if two angles are vertical, then they are congruent, then the converse says if two angles are congruent, then they are vertical. Notice if didn't move, then didn't move. The only thing that moved was P and Q. And make sure you add the words that make it make a little bit more sense. Sometimes you have to change some pronouns into the actual subject and, and so on. So the converse flips it around. The inverse takes the original statement and does the opposite of each one. P to Q becomes not P to not Q. So if we have the same P to Q there, the inverse just puts a not in each part. So the inverse says, if two angles are not vertical, then they are not congruent. The inverse puts a not in each one. The contrapositive takes the original statement and it does both things. It flips it and puts a knot in each one. So P to Q, if two angles are vertical, then they are congruent. Flip it and put a knot in each one. If two angles are not congruent, then they are not vertical. It flipped it and it put a knot in each one. So the converse flips it, the inverse puts a knot in each one, and the contrapositive does both. So let's try some here. Write the converse, inverse, and contrapositive of the conditional statement. If a number is even, then the number is 4. Remember the converse flips it, the inverse puts a knot into it, and the contrapositive does both. The contrapositive flips it. If a number is 4, then it is even. It just flipped P and Q around. The inverse puts a knot in each one. If a number is not even, then it is not 4 and the contrapositive does both. If a number is not 4, then it is not even. The converse flips it, the inverse puts a not into it, and the contrapositive does both. For this one, if negative 5 the quantity squared is greater than 0, then negative 5 is greater than 0. Let's write the converse, inverse, and contrapositive of this. Now do remember that the opposite of greater than is less than or equal to. So we will put less than or equal to for each of the ones that need the not. So the converse flips it. If negative 5 is greater than 0, the negative 5 squared is greater than 0. It just flipped the P and the Q. 
the inverse takes the original and puts a knot in each one. And it's, it's the opposite of each one. The opposite of greater becomes less than or equal to. The opposite of greater here becomes less than or equal to. And the contrapositive does both. It flips it and puts a knot into each one. If negative 5 is less than or equal to 0, then negative 5 squared is less than or equal to 0. The converse flips it. The inverse puts a knot into each one. And the contrapositive does both. It flips it and puts a knot in each one. And sometimes you don't write the word knot. Sometimes you just do the opposite symbol. If it was greater, then not greater is less than or equal to. Last thing here is the biconditional. The biconditional is when a conditional statement and the converse are both true. If the conditional and the converse are true, then we can write the biconditional using the phrase if and only if, which you sometimes see abbreviated as IFF. IFF means if and only if. So, take this statement for example. If an angle is right, then it has a measure of 90 degrees. Well, that's a true statement. What about its converse? If an angle measures 90 degrees, then it is a right angle. Well, that's also true. So since the original conditional statement was true and the converse was true, then we can write the biconditional, which combines P and Q with if and only if. So the biconditional says an angle is right if and only if it measures 90 degrees. Notice this is not an if-then statement. If and then come out of it, you write P, and then it, you write if and only if, and then you write Q. So the biconditional, which originally, well, we originally had if P then Q, the biconditional just simply says P if and only if Q. And you might also see the symbolic representation, and I'll write it up here, P with a double arrow, Q. The double arrow means if and only if. P if and only if Q. So that's the biconditional. So remember your symbolic representation, your converse, inverse, contrapositive, and all forms of logic there. If then statements, your hypothesis, your conclusion, and that does it.